I know there's other groups or other uh, 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 races that don't go to hospital. They have their child outside the hospital and they don't get a birth certificate, not a social security card. So it depends on the status of the people. Well, yes and no. Number one, there's only one race on the planet. Nations or nationalities. Um, dealing with the birth certificates and when your mother delivers you over to the state, which will make you a ward of the state, that's an unconscionable contract because a woman's divine nature will never give up her offspring to become a debtor. That is not in a woman's true divine nature to do that anyway. So if a woman was to give her child over to the state, it's unconscionable because that is not the true nature. A woman would never do that. Yes, which will automatically prove that the woman did not know the terms and conditions of that contract. Or was not conscious herself. Yes, which makes it unconscionable or adhesion. It's long. That goes back to the state of the people again, of their mindset. They're depending on the system to, to bring forth that child. If it was, if it were independent, we would need that system. So that's how they fall into that adhesion contract, because you're going to them to help assist in that act. Okay, we're dealing with you. Absolutely correct. But what we're dealing with is the condition at the time of a contract, because that determines how that contract is executed or enforced. That still goes back to the condition of the mind of the person. Yes, but that's what makes the difference between if it's an enforceable contract or is it not. The consciousness of the mind of the person or the parties binding a contract and the legal standing of the person at the time of the contract. See, everything we do is based on a contract. So how conscious are we at the time that we indulge in these contracts? I'm talking about from day one. Because everybody is by nature born free and independent. So everyone is sovereign by nature. Everyone comes out the womb sovereign. What is sovereignty? two definitions on sovereignty. I think we got to pay close attention to is how contracts are being enforced in the court of law. Because all of us have been to court one time or another. But different situations, different torts, There have a number of statues or complaints that they're charging you with. But the nature of the tort or what they're charging you with is breach of contract. It means that they're saying that you had a contract somewhere and out of bad faith you breached it even though that's not what the charge may say. That's the nature of it. Every single time you enter that courtroom. Now, I'm going to read two definitions, one out the seventh edition and one out the fourth. Sovereignty, supreme dominion, authority, or rule. Supreme political authority of an independent state or the state itself. The supreme, absolute, uncontrollable power by which any independent state is governed, supreme political authority, paramount control of the constitution and frame of government and its administration, the self-sufficient source of political power, from which all specific political powers are derived, the international independence of a state combined with the right and the power of regulating its internal affairs without foreign dictation, 
also a political society or state which is sovereign and independent. That's more of an administration of political side of the government. I'm going more of the more of the esoteric meaning of it. The power to do everything in a state without accountability, to make laws, to execute and to apply them, to impose and collect taxes and levy contributions, to make war or peace, to form treaties or alliances, or to or of commerce with foreign nations or the like. Sovereignty is government is Sovereignty in government is the public authority which directs or orders what is to be done by each member associated in relation to the end of association. It is the supreme power by which any citizen is governed and is the person or body of persons in a state to whom there is politically no superior. The necessary existence of the state and the right and the power which necessarily follows its sovereignty. By sovereignty in its largest sense is meant supreme, absolute, uncontrollable power, absolute right to govern. Not it's long. It's long. What they what that meant, what they talk about there in the Black's Law Dictionary mm -hmm. is the political mm -hmm. sovereignty in the political sense. Mm -hmm. You would begin you would explain the sovereignty in its natural sense. Yes dealing with relating to natural rights or birth rights, mm -hmm. all right? So what happens is forming governments are formed. Governments are formed to protect these natural rights and, and birth rights. And that's the political sovereignty that, is, that he just read. But if he was talking about what he was, what the nature was talking about is birth rights. When you say well, you're born free, you're born sovereign, you talk about the natural rights. And I mentioned before, and I read, as I quoted, the Declaration of Independence, part of it. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal and endowed by their creator with certain and inalienable rights. Among these are life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. And this is what this is what the sovereignty in which he's referring, natural rights. Mm -hmm. So I just want to make that clarification. You, you broke it down very, very well. Yes. Explain the different it, levels of me. Indeed. And, and camel back off of that also. Even the political definition of it that was just read in the Black's Law Dictionary is still based on the spiritual level of the inalienable rights. Because it is your inalienable, inalienable right to govern. Where is our power and our authority deriving from? Right. It's de deriving from our creator. It's deriving from the zodiac. Zodiacus, the womb. So they acknowledge that even in the definition itself, because it doesn't come from physical man. It doesn't come from physical legislation. And we have to understand where those rights coming from. The administration of it is how it's being enforced upon the election of the people. Now what we're gonna do is Going back to what happens at the time of the contracts. It's not mentioned in these contracts, but what it is is, is discrediting the fact that you were created equal. The fact that you're free and independent. That's being waived in the contract without being written in the contract. And this is what's making us subject. That's depreciating our political status in the contract. Which discredits our legal standing to even make the reservation or to null and void the contract. Because it neutralizes the contract. Islam. How can you be sovereign and be dependent? How can you be sovereign and independent? No, and depend and depending. And dependent. Yes. And going right back to these contracts. Contact contracts. Sometimes you're in a weaker position. 
right? That weaker position might be the condition of being dependent. Now, now we have to get into what would be the reason we're dependent. One of them could be the fact that we have no lawful money. Now, the fact that we have no lawful money already puts us in a weaker position. It automatically puts us under duress. Now, if we make any contract where the consideration now is some type of money, and we don't have any money, it automatically puts us in a weaker position. It automatically makes us dependent. So that's why if it's Federal Reserve notes, well, most of the time it is, there is the consideration in these contracts that we're engaging into, how we're using those Federal Reserve notes now have to be stipulated. Because the Federal Reserve notes is now based on a service. So being that you're in a condition of being dependent because of the fact there's no lawful money, right? It automatically puts you under duress. And now you're using the Federal Reserve notes as your only remedy to try to satisfy or accommodate whatever it is you're contracting for. If it's the gas company to have my gas turned on, they want $100 in Federal Reserve notes. Now I have no other remedy. Correct? That's going to make me in a weaker position in this contract. That automatically makes it adhesion. But doing, going back to the War Powers Act and uh, gold and silver being taken off the market, I have no remedy now to pay this gas company. It doesn't mean I'm not sovereign anymore. I didn't waive any of my inalienable rights if I reserve my rights in that contract and stipulate how the Federal Reserve notes is being used in lieu of lawful money. So now I'm not dependent anymore. Because the gold and silver belongs to the people. The people are the actual money. Islam. Are you saying in essence that the Federal Reserve notes, mm -hmm. the gold and silver was taken out of circulation? Yes. And Federal Reserve note interject into circulation to steal the people's birthright? Yes. And Indeed. And sovereignty. And sovereignty. Being that the gold and silver was taken off the market, the only remedy you had was to use what they had called the Federal Reserve notes by the Federal Reserve system, banking system. So that became a service. The actual Federal Reserve notes that we call money actually is a service granted to you. Now, all depending on how you use this service depends or determines if you still maintain your sovereignty or do you accept a compelled benefit and waive your inalienable rights or your sovereignty by contracting with the Federal Reserve notes, with accepting the service. So the service constitutes contract. Now, what, con what constitutes is, is a valid contract or not is how we enter the contract. How are we using this consideration? Yes, the Federal Reserve notes was put there to steal the birthright and the sovereignty of the people. Because they know they can provide you with a service now that you have to accept because you have no other remedy which automatically makes it adhesion. Now, if you accept that contract without disclaiming it or rebutting the national debt that comes behind using the Federal Reserve notes, if you rebut it or disclaim it, it still maintains your legal standing or your sovereignty. But if you accept it without rebutting it, now you assume to take on this national debt that comes along with using the Federal Reserve notes, the service. Using the service puts you in debt. And you resume to be or assume to be a debtor for the national debt. It's long.
So that would be a result of being unconstitutional outside of constitutional and outside of common law principles? Yes. Because according to the common law and the constitution, only way you can satisfy a debt is through gold and silver coins. So it's actually more in the nature of fraud. If you're not conscious and you're using these Federal Reserve notes to compensate things, to if you're using them as substance, if you're using them to pay off certain debts, it's actually more in the nature of fraud. Because according to common law and constitution, you're not paying anything off. It will be fraud on the creditors and the debtors, which neutralizes that contract because the creditors know that. But the thing is, they're trying to get you to accept the color in it. Because once you accept it, now neutralize it. Yes, but what is, it, what is it that we're reserving? And that's what we got to understand. See, we have to understand the common law principles, which constituted the Constitution itself. The Constitution is a contract. It's an agreement. The word Constitution means makeup. Okay, makeup of what? You have different components that make up a constitution. Now, in law, in a political arena, when we're speaking on the supreme law of the land, the components that make up the written constitution, which is the contract, is based on our inalienable rights. It's based on the rights that's secured by the Constitution, which comes from the common law principles or comes from the creator or the zodiac. That's why we have what you call a divine constitution, divine contract. We have what you call a zodiac constitution, based on divine principles, divine components. Common law is based off common sense. It's long. The Constitution is a contract. Who is the contract between? Who is the, we phrase the question? If the Constitution is a contract, who, are the, who is the contract between? Who is the contract between? Good question. You have in the National Constitution for the United States of America, or North America, you have what you call a preamble. Now the preamble specifies who's making an offer, who's making an agreement. Preamble of the United States of America, United States Republic Constitution. We the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, now this is we the people, it's the first declaration of who's involved in the contract. Establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense promote the general welfare and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity. Do ordain and establish this constitution for the United States of America. So we have we the people ordaining, ordaining is the key word into this. 
and we're going to get, in, get into that in a minute. For, and this is who is for, the United States of America. Now, to understand that, we'll have to get into who is we the people and who is the United States of America. And at this time, I'm going to bring on Grand Sheik Tosh Tariq, and he'll get into that. You must understand what brought you to the point that you are. What I will begin with is the presentation of the Treaty of Peace and Friendship, 1787, between Morocco and the United States of America. Now, it must be understood by um, everyone that you're standing in Morocco. This is Maghrib El Aqsa. Maghrib El Aqsa means the extreme west. Are we clear? Maghrib El Aqsa means the extreme west. That's where you're standing. Let's read the treaty, the presentment of the treaty. 1787, to all persons to whom these presents shall come or be made known, whereas the United States of America in Congress assembled by their commission bearing date the 12th day of May 1784, thought proper to constitute John Adams, Benjamin Franklin, and Thomas Jefferson, their ministers, plenipotentiary, <coughs> pardon me, giving to them, or a majority of them, full powers to confer, treat, or negotiate with the ambassador, minister, or commissioner of his majesty, the imperial, the emperor of Morocco, concerning a treaty of amity and commerce, to make and receive propositions for such treaty and to conclude and sign the same, transmitting to the United States in Congress, assembled for their final ratification. And by one or other commission bearing date the 11th day of March 1785, did further empower the said ministers plenipotentiary, or majority of them, by, written, by writing under the hands and seals to appoint such agent in said business as they might think proper with authority under the direction and instruction of said ministers to commerce and prosecute the said negotiations and conferences for the said treaty provided that the said treaty shall be signed by ministers. And whereas we, the said John Adams and Thomas Jefferson, two of the said ministers plenipotentiary, the said Ben Franklin being absent, 